This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to This Week in FCPA, Episode 63 for the week ending July 28, 2017, the Rocky and Bullwinkle Edition. This week, Jay and I return for a wide-ranging discussion of some of the <coughs> week's top compliance and ethics-related stories, including the Halliburton resolution of its long-standing FCPA investigation and now enforcement action, the U.S. authorities in the Department of Justice and SEC declined to prosecute two companies of note, IBM and Newton Mining, with declinations issued this week. NAVEX releases its 2017 Ethics and Compliance Training Benchmark Report. We take a look at that. The Department of Justice uh, convicts a individual in a FCPA bribery case. We take a look at the conviction uh, out of the Eastern District of New York in a UN scandal. We note Everything Compliance Episode 15 is out and highlight some of the topics, including the right to be forgotten, uh, <coughs> corporate governance, excuse me, big data, corporate governance, and antitrust issues leadership shifting in anti cases across the globe, and the chicken chip club. If you want to increase your visibility in the greater compliance community, consider writing for the FCPA blog. Dick Casson has uh, uh, put a call out for additional authors, and we talk about that. Lastly, we end with three interesting topics. The first is June Foray died this week. She was the voice of Rocky the Flying Squirrel and Rocky and Bullwinkle. We take a look at her career as a voice animator. Second thing we look at is Jose Altuve. The Astros' all-star second baseman is currently hitting over 500 for the month of July, putting him in extraordinarily rarefied air for Major League Baseball. Only seven people have done this in the last 150 years. Finally, Jay takes a look at his weekend report, and it is about don't let your compliance program and enthusiasm drop during the summer. This really ties in, I think, quite well to the... uh, Halliburton, the facts around the Halliburton FCPA enforcement action. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening to This Week in FCPA. This Week in FCPA is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello again, Tom Fox here, along with Mr. Monitors, Jay Rosen, for episode 63 of This Week in FCPA for the week ending July 28th, 2017, the Rocky and Bullwinkle edition. Jay, uh, welcome. Good morning, Tom. Good to be with you. So for those who may have thought the uh, FCPA was uh, enforcement was slowing down, information was uh, coming to a screeching halt, and or your jobs were in jeopardy, uh, we are here to assure you that after this Rocky and Bullwinkle edition week, you will be convinced that uh, you not only still have a job, but you will continue to have a job, and you may need uh, they may need you even more going forward in the compliance function. So, Jay, we had quite a bit of activity this week, so why don't we just sort of hop right into it. Um, two of the biggest stories were Hallibert settling its longstanding uh, FCPA enforcement investigation and now enforcement action with the Securities and Exchange Commission. I'd like to maybe hold off uh, – towards a little bit later in our show to get into the specifics, but this is a very long-running action from facts around 2010, a uh, thorough investigation, and a uh, pretty significant, I think, uh, fact pattern that many that all compliance practitioners should study that we'll go into. Uh, but uh, pretty big news from the SEC on that front. On the DOJ front, um, and what can only be termed as a, uh, uh, a well-earned victory for the uh, Department of Justice. They convicted a Macau billionaire of FCPA offenses, money laundering uh, in the UN on, in a bribery case. And uh, here we had uh, Macau billionaire Ning Lap Singh was found guilty of bribing two United Nations officials in exchange for promoting development of a conference center. He was convicted of one conspiracy to commit bribery, and to violate the FCPA, one count of paying illegal bribes and gratuities, in other words, domestic bribery, two counts of violating the FCPA, one count of conspiracy to commit money laundering, and one count of money laundering. He faces um, really a long time uh, in prison for the FCPA offenses, five years, 10 years, up to 10 years for the domestic bribery conviction, and up to 20 years for the money laundering. 
So uh, a huge victory, a big uh, tip of the uh, trial lawyer hat to the Department of Justice uh, for uh, securing this um, verdict from the uh, federal court in Brooklyn. And um, a pretty uh, sad, sore eye, I think, on the the U.N. uh, as uh, U.N. officials Certain U.N. officials were involved uh, in uh, receiving the bribes, obviously. You pay a bribe, there's generally got to be somebody to receive it. So um, um, pretty significant news, I thought. Yeah, definitely. Um, In in terms of uh, what you and I are reading for our homework assignment, uh, any thoughts on the fact that this is an individual prosecution? Well, um, really no... uh, Nothing new or different other than I think when uh, Jeff Sessions became attorney general, he uh, he said if somebody violates the law, I'm going to prosecute it. Now, this prosecution began under the prior administration, but it certainly uh, continued forward under uh, the Sessions uh, Justice Department. And I think uh, that shows the department can convict people of FCPA violations and that they will uh, aggressively go after uh, defendants who violate the FCPA. There were uh, several other people uh, involved in this case, uh, Francis Lorenzo, a deputy ambassador for the Dominican Republic, had pled uh, guilty uh, to uh, bribery and money laundering. Another defendant, a uh, former UN General Assembly, uh, Assembly, uh, Assembly President and ambassador named John Ash, um, in, in, enigmatically died in an apparent accident five days before hearing on his trial. Uh, we also had Jeff Yin, who worked as an accountant with the defendant Ning, um, pleading guilty uh, in this case and waiting to be sentences. And finally, a, a woman named Sherry Yan pled guilty in 2016 to paying Ash more than $800,000 in bribes, and she's been sentenced to prison. So, uh, you know, when individuals are involved, certainly the department uh, has is going after them. Uh, that may also be one of the lessons from the SEC case because we had a $75,000 fine against an individual in the uh, Halliburton matter. But uh, we had a couple of declinations, and I thought maybe you might tell uh, tell us a little bit about those. Sure. So um, these were kind of interesting because they both came out in quarterly financial releases as opposed to a specific declination from the DOJ. And uh, one of them we have is uh, a multi-country bribery probe of IBM. And this has been going on for a while. And um, IBM said in their securities filing that these allegations date back to 2002 when the company told the SEC of a Polish anti-corruption authority investigation. Um, The SEC and Justice Department declined to comment. IBM has dealt with these allegations of violating the FCPA, which bars the use of the bribes to foreign officials or to keep business. And in 2001, the company had reached a settlement with the SEC to pay $10 million to resolve allegations of a decade-long campaign of bribery in Asia. So that was the IBM one. And then in terms of Newmont bribery, uh, that had been out there for a while. And again, this is just something that they slipped into their um, SEC uh, uh, filing. And they said in April, the company had to closed. It was reviewing its compliance with the FCPA. Uh, Newmont has active mining operations in Ghana, Australia, Indonesia, the U.S., Peru, and Suriname. So, uh, again, these are two kind of big names that have been out there. Um, you know, when we're always looking at the, uh, the list of companies that are uh, supposedly under investigation, these are two of the bigger names that have been floating out there. Tom, um, any thoughts? I know a couple weeks ago we were having a discussion with Matt Kelly about uh, the fact that on some of these declinations it seemed to be kind of boilerplate information. In this situation now we have really no information. Any thoughts on why they're coming out in terms of quarterly filings as opposed to declinations? Well, the declinations Matt talked about were declinations with disgorgement. So that's a new category that Department of uh, Justice developed in 2016, where a company where a company would uh, apparently had violated the FCPA. Yet, the Department of Justice declined to prosecute 
uh, providing the company met the four prongs of the pilot program, which were self-disclosure, extensive cooperation, uh, extensive remediation, and disgorgement of pro- uh, ill-gotten gain or illegal, illegally obtained profits. Uh, these two cases with IBM and Newton Mining did not fall into that category. So uh, what we don't know is, is, as you correctly pointed out, we don't know anything. We don't know what we don't know. We don't know if the Department of Justice and Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, operating in their prosecutorial discretion, uh, decided there were facts which warranted a prosecution, yet declined to do so. We don't know whether the Department of Justice and Securities and Exchange Commission decided there was no basis for a criminal or civil FCPA prosecution, and so notified the companies that they were simply closing their files. Uh, you and I and the rest of the FCPA community terms that a declination um, because they have declined to prosecute. And as a verb, that's a correct use of that word. But there are several different types of declinations, or at least uh, two, and you know perhaps more. Um, declination with uh, disgorgement is one. And this was a situation where both the DOJ and the SEC notified uh, once again IBM and Newton Mining uh, they were not moving uh, they were closing their files. So the company uh, I think correctly had to report these because this is certainly a public uh, uh, material public event for reporting purposes. But unless the company e, um, opens up its uh, books and records or at least publicly about the facts, we may not know. Any more about those? The Department of Justice and SEC have uh, taken the position in the past that they would not release information about a company they had declined to prosecute absent um, the approval of that company uh, because they didn't want to put companies in in bad light or companies didn't want that information getting out, period. So we're really left without knowing what the basis of the declination was for although we, I think, can assume that there was no declination with disgorgement. um, So that might lead one to believe that there was no FCPA violation, which would underlie an enforcement action. But once again, it could be the Department of Justice and and Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, as as is within their discretion, declined to prosecute. At this point, we just don't know. Great. Thank you for... uh clarifying that. And uh, so we've got two companies with declinations. Do we want to talk about the uh, uh, the focus of the FCPA world shifting back to where it rightly belongs in Houston, Texas? Well, um, the um, uh, let's let's go through the rest of the list and we can get to that uh, in a minute. Uh, or towards okay. the end, rather. Uh, we had a, a release of uh, NAVAX released its 2017 Ethics and Compliance Training Benchmark Report. It, it's a fascinating document, Jay. Um, uh, the, um, I'm just going to highlight some of the key findings. One was, uh, obviously, compliance has been in the news in the last year, but companies are recognizing that compliance missteps have dominated news cycles. Uh, this includes Volkswagen. This includes Wells Fargo. You know, you name the company that's gone through a scandal, they're finally recognizing that the compliance component of that. Uh, compliance has replaced culture as a top training objective, and it's complying with laws and regulations is the most uh, important ethics and training objective uh, noted, followed by creating a culture of ethics and respect. Um, compliance professionals are continued continuing to be asked to do more with less uh, and that their risk areas are uh, expanding. Uh, And then there was two, the last two points I thought were, for me, probably the most significant. And the first one, there are still significant gaps remaining with respect to board training. And boards of directors really don't understand their role. They don't understand their role in Measure, evaluating, measuring, protecting, and mitigating against risks. Uh, only 70% of board uh, of directors polled had received uh, training. Basically, that means four out of five have not received ethics and compliance training. So I think there needs to be a, a greater awareness of both from the compliance profession and the board that there needs to be more training at this level. Um, obviously, cybersecurity loss is uh, very important, and there seems to be a lack of 
or failure to educate directors about key risks and program features uh, for anything that's a major program vulnerability within the company. And then finally, something that uh, the Department of Justice has certainly been talking about, at least since the release of the evaluation of corporate compliance documents, is the uh, measuring effectiveness of training remains elusive for many organizations. That was specifically in the evaluation documents. How do you determine your training is effectiveness? So um, this is something that companies are going to have to uh, to take a look at and try to determine their effectiveness. Um, Dick Casson. Our good friend who runs the FCPA blog uh, has uh, put a shout out to uh, to readers, listeners, and others in the compliance community. If you uh, want to increase your visibility in the greater compliance community, why don't you write for the FCPA blog? At his uh, conference last year, he said that the FCPA he envisioned the FCPA blog to literally be a compliance community bulletin board, and I think uh, he's really held to that. I think he founded it in two thousand and seven. Um perhaps 2006, and it literally is that. Uh, and all, all he takes really all comers. So there's, uh, we have a link to it if you want to see how to, to do so. But if you're interested in uh, expanding your personal brand, if you've got something to say, if you want to be a part of the compliance community discussion, uh, I would certainly urge you to do it. I've made some uh, very good friends that I've uh, had over the years. I, I had breakfast with Scott Moritz a couple of weeks ago, and I met him literally in 2009 through his writing on the FCPA blog. So uh, if you're interested in uh, taking a look at it, uh, it's uh, linked to in the show notes. Um, Everything Compliance Episode 15 is out, Jay, and uh, this is uh, part two of a two-part episode that uh, you and I both were involved in. And this part, it's really Jonathan Armstrong and myself. We take a look at uh, the EU right to be forgotten, big data and compliance, and antitrust issues. We touch on the uh, chicken shit club and what it might mean for a lack of uh, – individual prosecutions in the Department of Justice. So it's, a, as always, a wide-ranging discussion, and I think uh, everyone uh, came out yesterday, so I hope people will uh, take a listen to it, and uh, we certainly had a good time uh, recording it. Um, so Houston, the great state of Texas and the great city of Houston, energy capital and FCPA epicenter of the world, once again demonstrates why it is the epicenter of the world. With the announcement of the Halliburton FCPA enforcement action, Jay, uh, this was a Securities and Exchange Commission enforcement action. It was not a Department of Justice. The Department of Justice declined to do so. And it really spoke about internal controls. At least that was the message it spoke to me, Jay. Um, there, there was a, a really interesting fact pattern where Halliburton was um, trying to engage a, a local Angolan to meet a local content requirement of a contract for the Angolian Angolan National Energy Company, Sonegal. And they engaged one uh, agent who apparently was selected by the, or, or at least recommended by the Angolan government. And there were multiple internal controls at Halliburton regarding the use of agents, which really uh, were um, – overridden or subverted. So uh, the uh, local a, uh, local representative did not go through the agent and third party commercial agent uh, Halliburton program. So they switched it over to the supply chain. And even there, Halliburton had certain internal controls around sole source um, vendors and uh, vendors who um, the types of services they would deliver, certain requirements to articulate those as a business justification. All of those were overridden by Halliburton. Uh, They completely failed to uh, satisfy their own local, excuse me, their own internal requirements. And um, to the point where uh, the local Angolan uh, agent was uh, scheduled to receive some $13 million for services that Halliburton's own um, personnel who looked at it said, well, we we could do it for, for cheaper than that. So, it really brought up, Jay, a dynamic tension that many companies feel around local content requirement. And that's, uh, I think, a, a significant question that many companies, uh, if they don't struggle with, they're going to need to confront. Uh, many countries have that. It is certainly from a CSR perspective an appropriate, I believe, uh, requirement that uh, you have local content. Uh, it, some countries and national oil companies 
have a requirement that you actually do more than just hire our local people. You train them, and you train them to be uh, run businesses in the 21st century. That in the energy industry, that can mean everything from uh, you know using a, a wrench to change a nut on a pump or uh, the manual labor part of it, but it can also be running a, a commercial agent operation where you're utilizing, you name the uh, the software that many of the companies we've worked at would use uh, just to run an ERP or um, an accounts payable system. So um, Salesforce, ADP, um, SAP, uh, those all of those software programs are part of the today's business environment. And, and if you've never utilized those, you may need to be trained on those. So you see a dynamic tension here, uh, but you also see where Halliburton's internal controls were overridden. And um, for me, that's the lesson uh, for the compliance practitioner is you cannot just have internal controls. They have to be effective. And you could certainly expand that out to an entire compliance program, but here it's, it's most starkly set out. So uh, I've pontificated on for a while. What do you see from reading all this? Yeah, uh, I think that you really, really took the lead on this, Tom, that um, a lot of these situations, um, as we know, come down to people trying to find, you know, if there's a will, there's a way. And people are trying to find creative ways to get around bringing on a vendor or get on get around bringing on a bidding process. So to your point, those even if you have the best internal controls, if there's somebody who has the will or the way to subvert them and go around, uh, that's where we sometimes end up in uh, resolutions like this. So, uh, you know, I I think it really augurs for what you talk about a lot, which is really embedding those processes and procedures in your, um, you know, in your daily workflow of information. And if you're bringing on that local content to be part of your bid, You've got to bring them on for more than just a name. They can't be part of, you know, you can't take their CV and put them in the bidding package. But to your point, they need to be trained and brought up to the same level of expectation that you have for the remainder of your global operations. So a couple of other points was that there is a monitor required. It's in the uh, order. It's called an independent consultant. But that monitor is an 18-month monitorship, and the responsibility is to review and evaluate Halliburton's anti-corruption policies and procedures, uh, including those relating to local content and the use of sole source justifications uh, for the company's business operations in Africa. Uh, The second thing that I alluded to is there was an individual, uh, Janot Lorenz, who agreed to a civil penalty of $75,000. Uh, I think this is the highest civil penalty, uh, individual civil penalty we've seen on a uh, SEC, FCPA enforcement action. And to me, that sends the clear signal that the uh, SEC is taking a very hard look at individuals. So uh, we'll just have to see how that plays out going forward. Um, Having said all this, obviously uh, a declination for Halliburton on the criminal side of things. Uh, the, the Department of Justice declined to prosecute, so kudos to uh, Halliburton for uh, not having a criminal prosecution. And the uh, the fine and penalty was uh, close to, I think, $29.2 million. It consisted of $14 million for profit disgorgement, uh, $14 million civil penalty, and a one point two for prejudgment interest. So uh, fairly, uh, I would say, uh, low-end fine and penalty for Halliburton on uh, the penalty part. Um, And the message out there for you compliance practitioners is um, you've got to test the effectiveness of your internal controls and you have to have visibility of uh, into high risk areas. And if compliance had been involved in this, perhaps uh, none of this would have happened. So there were two other things that I really want to talk about this week, Jay. Uh, The first one is June Foray. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know who June Foray was? Ah uh, yes, the voice of Rocket J. Squirrel, among many other people, over her almost a uh, hundred years on Earth. Yes, uh, ninety-four years old when she died. She was the first lady of animating voice, voicing. Uh, she worked in voice. Her work was truly prodigious. 
She voiced Lucifer the Cat in Cinderella, A Mermaid and a Squaw in Peter Pan, Wheezy Weasel and Lena Hyena in um, Who Framed Roger, Roger Rabbit. Rabbit. She was little Cindy Lou Who on The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. She was Ursula, my personal hottie favorite of all time from George of the Jungle, and Aunt Mary Parker, or excuse me, Aunt May Parker on Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends uh, back from the 70s. She literally did work, uh, voice work in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, aughts, and in 2013, she won an Emmy, became the oldest person to, uh, to win an Emmy for her work as Mrs. Cauldron on The Garfield Show. So uh, just a legendary uh, voice performer. She also did um, Nell from Dudley Do-Right, Granny in Tweety and Sylvester, and probably the greatest tribute I came across of her was from Chuck Jones, the legendary animator who proposed her star on Hollywood's Walk of Fame and who said that June Foray is not the female Mel Blanc, but Mel Blanc was the male June Foray. So um, I'm going to watch Rocky and Bullwinkle this weekend. So uh, uh, I just uh, love that cartoon. And I was probably in my mid-30s when I found out that Rocky was actually a girl. So uh, I've been a huge June Foray fan uh, since then. Hey, you'll be able to uh, put on your What's the Matter You uh, sweatshirt and watch and have a smile on your face. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, NFL training camps open this week, and I thought we were going to talk about that. But, Jay, there's another sports item that I really want to talk about more, um, and that is the Astros all-star second baseman Jose Altuve has hit or at least as of today, recording this on July 28th, is hitting over 500 for the month of July. And this is an incredibly rare feat since um, uh, baseball has started keeping records. There have been seven instances of a player going through a month with uh, at least 100 plate appearances and batting over 500. And let me just tell you who some of those folks were. George Sisler, Hall of Famer. Ty Cobb, Hall of Famer. Shoeless Joe Jackson uh, should be in the Hall of Fame, but uh, um, got waylaid by the Black Sox scandal. He did it twice. And Rogers Hornsby. So that's some pretty elite company. And um, I was listening. It was interesting. I was listening to, uh, I think it was on, uh, uh, pardon the interruption, and uh, they said, you know, this is great, uh, except he's the fourth best player on the Astros. So how do you have a uh, – someone hitting 500 for a month and uh, be a fourth best player. I guess that's why they have the second best uh, record in baseball, but a uh, huge shout out to one of the more diminutive baseball players at five foot six, Jose Altuve and his 500 uh, batting average month. Yeah. It's, it's also pretty impressive when you look at that list of the names that you read that most of these folks played in a different era of baseball in the the 1910s and the 1920s and then the only person on that list that's from the current modern era is uh todd helton so uh you know the the pitchers are stronger they're throwing faster uh the, the batters are you know really having to get up there and you know in in baseball if you get a hit once of every three times you're considered success so for him to get a hit consistently for a month every other time is just a, a pretty amazing feat once read that uh ty cobbs ty cobb his ultimate goal was to hit over 500 for a season and he thought it was a realistic goal uh, but he was never able to achieve it. I think uh, his highest was, uh, I'm sure someone will correct me, one of our listeners, but I think it was 464. Um, but uh, still, 500 for a month is is really, when you put it up against the list of people who've done it, and all but Helton are in the Hall of Fame, it's uh, it's truly one for the record books. Uh, I've been watching the Astros game just to, to see him hit the ball. So uh, it's been a ton of fun. So uh, do you have a weekend uh, report for us this weekend, Jay? Yeah, I finally got it up. So um, as we discussed, uh, I was inspired by the girls coming back from camp and uh, 
we uh, posted on LinkedIn is don't let your ethics and compliance skills lapse over the summer. So taking a look at, you know, this is a real, uh, we're coming up on the month of August, which at certain points uh, tends to be a little bit slower. And I suggest instead of getting kind of uh, caught up in the dog days of summer, that this is a great opportunity to take a look at your ethics and compliance programs, look at things that really worked, look at things that maybe didn't work so well, and use this as an opportunity to uh, recharge your batteries and go into the end of the year in a very strong position. Well, Jay, that's uh, that's a great message, and that really ties into the uh, the Halliburton um, uh, FCPA enforcement action, and really even the NAVEX findings, uh, because the clear emphasis and the frustrations are on the effectiveness. So if you have a program in place, if you work very diligently to put the the nuts and bolts or the backbone of a compliance program in place. Now it's the, the time to, to reinvigorate towards effectiveness. So it's a great message, and uh, we'll definitely link to that in uh, the show notes as well. So, Jay, we're uh, nearing the end of our time, but uh, I was wondering if you might uh, take us home this week. Sure. Um, let's see. On behalf of Tom Fox, the compliance evangelist, and myself, Jay Rosen, we'd like to thank you for uh, – spending some time with us today and hearing about the fact that Houston is still the epicenter of the FCPA of the FCPA world. So this has been this week in the FCPA for the week ending July 28th, 2017. Thanks for joining us. This is Tom Fox. I'm the compliance evangelist, and I'd like to thank you again for joining us for this episode of This Week in FCPA. If you have listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate our podcast as it would help in our rankings and also help get the word out about the only weekly wrap-up podcast in compliance and ethics. Also, if you have any questions, you can email myself, Tom Fox at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. You can email Jay Rosen at jrosen at affiliatedmonitors.com. This is Tom Fox. Thanks again for listening to this episode, and I hope you'll join us again for another episode of This Week in FCPA. This Week in FCPA is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.